Well, hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, Cars and Coffee with me, Kenny, Kenny Brown, actually. And uh, we've got some uh, some things that we can talk about this morning. You uh, probably haven't seen me for the last couple of weeks, so we'll be talking about that here pretty soon. Uh, but uh, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, I hope I can answer some of your questions. And we've got some great questions that came in from the Speed Therapy Society this week. And I hope that uh, you want to send in some more questions because uh, when we get to, towards the end, I will be answering some of your questions live along with the questions that came in through the Speed Therapy Society. Uh, if you're not a Speed Therapy Society member, uh, I'd like you to join. Uh, there's a lot of cool things going on, a lot of, a lot of interaction between our society members. Lots of things to talk about. Okay, so something looks different today, uh, if you hadn't noticed. Well, the reason I haven't been here for the past two weeks, there's too many reasons. Number one, we moved. We relocated a few doors down, which gives us uh, some more space that we really need. <clears throat> but it also has this room that uh, I think we're going to kind of turn into a studio. Uh, I haven't figured out how we're going to do that yet. This is sort of a, uh, a work in progress, but I think as, uh, as the weeks go on, we'll figure out how to, how to turn this into a studio which is pretty cool. The other thing is because we've got more space here, uh, I think in the future we may open up to, if car clubs are coming through town on a Saturday morning, uh, you may be able to come in and, and uh, sit and, and watch the show. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, let's see. We've got, uh, uh, we've got, we've got some, we're gonna be talking about some IRS 99 to 04 COBRA on a couple of different subjects. Uh, we're going to talk about the Speed Therapy Academy, registering for the Speed Therapy Academy again. Uh, and IRS Rear Steer Kit, we had a question on that. And we've got some other interesting questions from the Speed Therapy Society. So uh, let's see. I'm already on the second page. So let me start out because the, uh, because we've been moving, Carrie's been out for a little bit. We've just kind of had to throw today together. So, but we've got some good questions and I would come up with some good information for you. So I think uh, what we're gonna do is, uh, we'll just go to questions because that's what we have mostly of this morning and the questions actually lead into the show and tell for the day. So um, Henry DeSantos uh, has a good question. He says, can, I make, can you give me a good overview of wheel and tire fitments that you use in the S197 Mustangs? Okay, as far as wheels, I break the wheels into three categories. 18 inch wheels are for racing because most of the race tires are 18 inch and most of the sanctioning bodies require 18 inch. So 18 inches for racing. 19 inch wheels are for uh, street performance and track days. And I look at 20 inch wheels as for show. I'm not a big fan of running 20 inch wheels on track. There's a lot of unsprung mass. Uh, and also the, the sidewall on the tires gets pretty short. And we really need, for the weight of a Mustang, you need some sidewall. So that's the wheel size. Now, if somebody's running, like we'll, we'll drop the, the race stuff off because that's a whole different subject. But as far as street performance and track, if somebody wants to run like a square setup, uh, then my recommendation is 19 by 10 off four corners with 285, 35, 19s. 285, 35 is a nice tall tire and it works really great. It puts a lot of tire on the ground. And if you're running the square setup, then if you want, you can, you can like rotate your tires. So that, that's what we run for a square setup. Now, mostly on the S197s, the package that we run is a 1910 front and 1911 rear, because a lot of cars we do are, are Coyotes uh, or GT500s, and they've got, they've got a little bit of snort to them, so they've got extra power. So in that case, I'll either run 285-35 on the front and 305-30 on the back, uh, depending on the car and the application, maybe I use a, a 295-30 on the front and 305 on the back. Now for like high horsepower applications, you know, we could get into some, depending on the tires, we could get into some 315s in, in, over the 305s if somebody's like a GT500 with a lot of horsepower. But basically, you know, my, my normal setup is a 285-35 on the front, 19 by 10, uh, 305-30 on the back, and 19 by 11. And that seems to be, I mean, there's lots of room, everything works, and the cars perform really well. Uh, sometimes if somebody isn't running a lot of power, 
for the, the 285 to 305. Uh, what I might do is play with the rear spring rates a little bit to uh, improve uh, front tire wear uh, because that's that's always putting a lot of weight on the front tires. Uh, so anyway, that's that's kind of like my recommendation for tires. And uh, if anybody has any other questions, uh, again, you can sign up for the 15 minute consults and I can talk through what your application is, what type of tires you want to use. And uh, I, I can give you more information for your application. Okay, uh, now here's the next one. Now, for some reason, the names didn't come through on the rest of these. So I'll just have to say a, a, a Cars and Coffee, uh, a Cars and Coffee viewer, because I, uh, I have a full IRS swap in my uh, SN9595 Mustang. I want to use your, your, your uh, let's see, I want to use your subframe to start building on and upgrading all the components but it's only advertised to work on a 99 to 04 new edge. Can you confirm this will both into a 94 to 98? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the only reason we advertise for 99 to 04, because that's what the IRS came in, was a 99 to 04 uh, Cobras. Uh, you, can put, you can put the IRS in any of the S, uh, SN95 cars from uh, like 94 all the way up. Uh, the other thing, we have a lot of customers right now who are actually putting the IRS into Fox cars. And because we had so many people that want to put the IRS in Fox, we actually changed the, the, uh, the template on the back of our hard map. When we do the, the full geometry uh, upgrade on the IRS carrier, we whack off that great big ugly hunk of uh, mount, mount in the back and throw it away. And instead, we put a bracket on there that bolts straight to the frame rail, which means we hard mount the, uh, the carrier, the frame rail. And it has had the holes in there for an SN95, but we've had so many people with foxes that we added a couple extra holes and elongated one so that it'd be an easy bolt up for most of the fox cars. Okay, because you get back in early years and there's a lot of a lot of strange things that go on, but we've got the IRS package that will bolt up to most of the fox cars. Uh, and, and if it doesn't bolt directly, it shouldn't be take very much to get the bolt on. So, I mean, getting back to your question, absolutely. I mean, uh, you can if, if you can easily uh, bolt that onto a 95 uh, without any problem at all. And of course, we have all the bits and pieces, and we're going to talk about some of those bits and pieces here in just a minute. Okay, here's another question uh, from another Speed Therapy Society or uh, Cars and Coffee viewer. And it says, uh, do you need to upgrade uh, upgrade the water pump when you change to a triple triple pass design? Now, I'm, I mean, we have two triple passes. We've got a triple pass radiator, and we have a triple pass uh, intercooler uh, for the uh, for the GT500s. In either case, I don't see a necessity. I mean, we've never had for the radiators. We've never never ever had to upgrade uh, water pumps. Uh, it's just the radiator just makes it more efficient. I mean, the same amount of water flows to the radiator. And it just goes across the radiator three times rather than diagonally once. Uh, so we get full coverage to the radiator and they cool a lot better. I mean, we've had a customer with a GT350 up at Road America, took almost 30 degrees of water temperature out of, of his car. We've had other people, you know, put it, come in and, and even down in Texas uh, where it's hot, not see it's a huge rise in the oil temperature that we're seeing. So really, you don't need to change the water pump. You just need to drop the radiator in. If it's for the uh, for the intercooler, for the uh, supercharger, again, I sh I don't see the need for changing because you're still still same amount of water is flowing through the uh, the radiator. So I really don't see the need for upgrading the water pump. Uh, let's see now. This is this is an IRS question. We're going to get to in the end because that's going to lead into show and tell this week. Let's see. I've got this. This is this is a question that's come up a couple times. I've I've got a, a 2007 Mustang GT, and I bought some Ford performance camshafts. I'm assuming those are the hot rod cams for the three valves. I was wondering how much it would cost to get them installed, and do I need other parts? Okay, here's the, here's here's the thing. Now, if if you scour the internet, you get there's like the information is all over the board. On, on what happens if you install just the camshafts. I really, you know, doing just the camshafts 
I don't don't see you getting a lot of gain. It's going to sound really cool. It's going to get that lope that you lope that you lope. But as far as power, I don't think you're going to pick up more much more than maybe 15 horsepower. Although if you read the advertisements, it says more. Uh, I think Ford says that with uh, with the cams, uh, intake manifold, and headers, you pick up 30 horsepower. If you have the CNC heads, that picks up 50 horsepower. So what I'm getting to is the when you do an upgrading camshaft, you've got to kind of bring everybody to the party. You really need to make some other improvements to the airflow event because, I mean, uh, internal combustion engine is nothing more than an air pump. You know, air comes in, gets compressed, it goes out. So th th there's nothing more than pump air. There's, of course, there's an explosion in the middle that helps the air go out the other side. But if you if you if you're bringing air in and pushing air out, if you change one thing, like just the camshaft, then you're not really going to get take full advantage of the uh, the profile that's in the camshaft and the in increase in cam profile. Uh, what you really need to make those cams work is at least the CNC heads. Uh, you know, my recommendation we we did uh, a while back. We took on, on Cliff's FR 500s. It was 2008 FR500S. Uh, we upgraded it to uh, 2011 World Challenge engine specs. Uh, in 2000, and if you may think back in 2009 and 10, the Mustang Challenge ran with the FR500S cars. I, I engineered three of those cars for the Mustang Challenge series. But the series ended in 2010, so there was no place for the cars to go. So the, uh, the SCCA made provisions for the FR500S in the in the uh, uh, 2011 World Challenge with some upgrades, upgrades to improve the performance because they had to run against some pretty hot cars, including the Boss S Mustangs. Uh, one of those uh, upgrades was my suspension, my AGS 4.0 suspension, which we did the Cliffs, actually we did 4.5, which is the next, next level up. But what we did for the engine, we did the full, just to kind of keep it in, in the same vein as what the, uh, the 2011 spec would be. We did the hot rod cams, we did the CNC heads, we did the improved intake manifold, bigger throttle body, and log tube headers. And I got the, the, the Ford CNC heads are no longer available, so I went to my friends at Livernoise, and they've got, for the three valves, they've got stage one, two, and three. All of them are just excellent, excellent cylinder heads. If you're looking for a good CNC head, uh, look no further than liver noise. What I chose was the stage two. Stage one was more of a street application. Stage three was sort of like full race. So this was just a track day car. So we just went with stage two, which was a little better than the original Ford CNC heads, which would be equivalent to stage one. And uh, we got that. We put it on the dyno and got a tune. And what we did, we came up with, and here's, here's the dyno. It's hard to see. Reflection of light. Uh, you can't see it there. What we came up with, we ended up with uh, uh, 380 horsepower and uh, 340 pounds of torque. Now, if you do the math on 380 horsepower, uh, you know, add, add the uh, the losses back in, you come up somewhere around 440 uh, for uh, horsepower, which would put you right in the same ballpark as a uh, Coyote motor, uh, like the Boss motor, I think was 444. So, I mean, that whole combination, stage two heads, the hot rod cams, the uh, Ford racing intake manifold, throttle body, and uh, long tube headers, of course, cold air kit, and a tune. You know, we, we took it from, you know, 300 horsepower up to, you know, like close to 440, which is a pretty big improvement. So getting back to your original question is, you know, we wouldn't do just camshafts. Uh, that's, to me, that that's a lot of money for not a lot of gain. Uh, to chase swap the camshafts out. I mean, you might find some of the wood. I, I'd strongly recommend you start thinking about adding to the camshafts to make it work better. And you know, CNC heads, uh, no less, you should have no less than long tube headers, uh, the Ford intake manifold and cold air and a tune. Uh, I think that's what you need to make the, make the cams work. So uh, I hope that's a good answer for you. If, if you want to know more, uh, again, you can always sign up for one of my 15-minute consults, and uh, you know, we, we can kind of talk through your different options on how you can set that car up for good, for good performance. Okay, now we have uh, 
So yeah, this, 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 this is this is kind of takes me into my way back machine. So I've been 99 Cobra. Word is you have the best IRS springs around. Uh, how can I order some? Okay, what I'm guessing is like back when we did a lot of Cobra before I took that time off for health, we actually had our own springs made for the O. We couldn't find anything that was any good for O three O four Cobras. Uh, you know, with, with the with the Terminator motor that had a lot of weight in the front, that had a lot of power. So we actually uh, went went to one of our suppliers and had springs made to my specifications. Well, uh, a long time has, has passed since then, and we really haven't uh, because we moved. You know, kind of like beyond that, we haven't really uh, gone back and, and and produced those. But as luck would have it, one of our one of our spring suppliers does have a couple of, of uh, springs that are pretty close to what we used to have. Now for the, they've got the, the one they've got that's the closest to what we used to do for the GT5 or for the GT500s, for, for the, for the, uh, the, the, uh, the Cobra Terminators uh, are like maybe 10 or 20 pounds more than my original springs. Uh, and the front variable actually adds to that which is for, for, uh, for a supercharged car with all the extra weight is what I would go with. But you've got a 99. They don't have nearly as much front weight. Fortunately, there's another spring package that's actually a little bit more aggressive than uh, what, as far as front spring rate than what we used like in the GTs. Uh, but it's, it's, it's pretty close to what we're using now. And those are available. And uh, they lower, either one of these lower, well, on the GT5, GT500 for, for the for the Cobra Terminators, uh, it it lowers the car about an inch and a half roughly depending on equipment, and for the other springs, the 59 springs, uh, they lower the car about the same, about an inch and a half, and it's it's a it's a really great spring package. Uh, they are uh, uh, 529, and we can certainly get them for you. I, I would recommend uh, unless you're on the racetrack. I'd recommend sticking with the lower rate springs uh, just because the, 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 co the plain 99 Cobra is a lot lighter than an 0304 Cobra. So it's kind of like my recommendation. Now, which brings me to another point. Anytime you increase spring rates, you absolutely positively have to improve your shocks. You have to go to a performance shop because if you don't, then the springs are going to overwhelm the factory shock and they're going to, it's going to be terrible. You're going to get bad ride quality. Uh, the shocks are going to go away really fast. So anytime you increase spring rate, you in, need to increase shock rate, specifically rebound, because that, that's the big thing you need when you go increase on spring rate, because what happens like you've gone around a corner and the spring, you know, will, will compress. Well, what happens if you compress a spring and you stop compressing it is, you know, it kind of sprongs out. Well, the whole idea of rebound is to control how quickly or slowly that spring becomes unwound or un uncompressed uh, and that's why we use a lot of rebound uh, adjustment when we're tuning cars at the track so i'd recommend at the very least uh like some uh, uh some coney yellow sports uh that's 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 a single adjustable and that would be more than enough shock to handle the springs and i think you'd be pretty pretty happy and impressed with just how well the car rode and handled uh, so anytime you do getting back anytime you increase spring rate you have to increase uh, shocks. And then going back, this is going back in a way back machine again. We were working on Fox cars uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, we had an aftermarket. We had our, we used to get our, our uh, the basic spring pack because we used some Ford Racing, but they stopped making them. So I had to go to another manufacturer, have them make them for me. But it, it, was, a, it was a pretty good increase in spring rate. But we always used, back then, it was mostly Coney Reds. Uh, you can't get the Coney Reds anymore, so now it's all uh, Coney Yellows. But we always put them, you know, the springs and shocks together, and they were great. We had uh, so many people would call me and say that, well, if you increase spring rate, you're going to get a really harsh ride quality. And that's not the case. I mean, ride quality, springs just support the car. Ride quality comes from the shock valving. And where that was coming from is people back then would just throw a set of performance springs on with stock shocks. And I mean, it was way more spring than the shock could handle. And the net result is uh, a really bad ride quality, really harsh, choppy ride quality. So you get the right, you get the right shocks with increased spring rate and it's gonna be fine. You try to put 
increased spring rate with stock shocks, especially in the older cars, and it, it, you're not going to get a good outcome. So just remember, springs hold the car up, shocks control the ride quality. So, yeah, let us know if, uh, you know, we, we can get you set up with those springs. I think you'd be happy with them. And also, we can get the Koenig shocks for you if you want. I, 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 strongly, I strongly recommend uh, performance shocks to go with any in, increase of spring rate. Uh, here's, here's a question I'm not really sure. I'm just going to have to make some guesses here from, from Greg. Uh, for a S197 GT500, what will you recommend for a street setup that would allow adjustment to make uh, adjustment, but make the factory ride height available? I'm guessing I'm guessing you're talking about uh, spring and shock packages. It's it's kind of a it's kind of a tough question to answer because most aftermarket uh, performance spring and shock packages will lower the cars uh, at least an inch. Uh, even even the ones that are right head adjustable typically will bring the car down about an inch. So I mean we've got some really great uh, coilover packages for the GT 500s, uh, but it's you know getting back to the uh, the factory ride height. Uh, I mean we could probably do that with some uh, with our strange package because I could actually use a longer spring on that, uh, but you're not going to get as much. You're not going to be able to lower the car as much as normal, so it's kind of like it's kind of like a catch-22. I mean, the performance springs and shocks are going to lower the car about an inch. And getting adding that inch back up, uh, and most I think the the trains might be the only ones that would have enough adjustment on the coilovers to get that uh, that one inch back. But again, this this sounds like a, a you know a 15 minute console question, and uh, I'm sure that you know uh, Brad or Kerry can put up a link. Uh, so you can sign up for 50 minute console we, we can kind of talk through and, and so i can get a little better idea exactly what you're looking for how you're using the car because i mean it's, it's, i don't have like, like here take my spring and shock package it's a performance package you know that's not the way it works here i mean you need to talk to me and we figure out what you need what kind of spring rate you need and then i customize the package for you and, and anybody that sells you springs with, without any indication what the spring rates are uh you know, how do you know what you're getting? So you really, really need to know what your spring rate is. And for me to give you the right spring rate, I need to know a lot about the car. You know, how are you using it? What tires? How much, how much power? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And then, I, then I can figure out spring rates. But any, any of the packages we have will probably lower the car at least an inch, uh, some more. But I think this Strange might be the only one that we could set it so we can add a little more back to it as far as height so okay now this kind of like reason remember you can send quite if you have any questions send them in we'll get to them in a little bit uh, this is kind of like because of we've been so uh, discombobulated around here over the last couple of weeks uh, this is kind of like a not a normal cars and coffee because they really haven't had a whole a bunch of time to prepare and uh, as, as you can tell this is a little bit different room and uh, this is uh, one of the spare rooms in the new space we moved into. And it actually used to be a conference room. We thought, you know, this might work pretty good for my little studio. So uh, that's what for you missed earlier in the show. Uh, I'm Kenny Brown, this is Cars and Coffee, and this is kind of like our new space. Uh, a few weeks back, we moved from, actually just same same building, just a few doors down in, in a much larger space. And this was a spare room that we didn't need. So we thought, ah, that looks like a great room for a studio. So it's a work in progress. Uh, we need to work with it a little more, figure out uh, better lighting and things. But it's, uh, it's uh, and I think it has real potential. And like I said earlier, you know, once we sort of get this set up, if you've got a, a, a car club or something coming through Indiana, Indianapolis, uh, there is a chance in the future that uh, uh, you could come and, uh, and watch the show because there's enough room to have people. So that's, you know, keep that in mind too. So let's get to our last question, which, uh, or no, Brad, you said we had another question come in at the last minute. Yes, we do. I just posted it on the screen. Uh, what are the advantages of having a coil over in the rear instead of the coil separated from the shock? And that's from Marcus White, who's a Speed Therapy Academy alumni member. Okay, there's a lot of differences. One, having the uh, the, uh, the coil on the shock 
you have a lot more range of ride height. You can adjust the ride height up and down. Uh, but the biggest advantage is spring rates. When you've got springs that go on the on the control arm, or like stock replacement springs, your 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 spring rates are pretty limited, um, and most of them are, you know, like not really enough spring to make the car work really well. So the biggest advantage is spring rate, because like I said before, I mean, I I can pick the spring rate uh, that I think you're going to need, and with the coilover, uh, if, if we, I, I picked it up. If it's somebody starting out on track, I'm going to come up with a softer spring rate than somebody that's advanced. Because the more spring you put into the Mustang, the better it turns and the faster it goes. But in the same token, the more spring you put in, the, like the, the, your window, your, your window for error, your error window starts shrinking down. So I, I don't like putting uh, inexperienced people on high rate springs uh, because it, it's like, yeah, you don't have enough you know, uh, experience to react. Although with, if you get like one of our full suspensions, it makes it easy. It makes the car a lot more predictable and you don't have to worry about as much about that. But I mean, the big thing is spring rate. I mean, I, I can pick the spring rate that I want. And if uh, you change the application, you know, it's maybe a half an hour job to, you know, take one spring off, drop another one on, poof, made the spring rate go higher or lower. Uh, you know, so the, the big advantage to me is spring rate, being able to choose your spring rate uh, along with adjustability knife. I've seen some aftermarket lower control arms that actually you yeah, have have some adjustability, but you're still stuck with whatever springs come off the shelf. And I can tell you that you know, I've got I've got pages and pages of different spring rates from different spring companies and uh, anything that comes off the shelf is not what I would call uh, true performance springs. Uh, they're yeah, they're, they're certain, mostly lowering springs, uh, and uh, the lowering springs don't have much increase in rate. And there are like some some touring springs. Uh, that's what most of them are out there. Uh, to, to give you an idea, just roughly an idea, like I'll start that's one ninety seven. Uh, front spring rate is in the what one I can't one forty one fifty range. Front spring rate. Uh, anything you can get off the shelf only gets you up to two hundred, maybe two twenty. Uh, unless you get some of our springs from one of our suppliers, then we can go a little bit higher. Nevertheless, but for for our, our touring package, it is a 350 front. Street performance is 400. Uh, uh, novice to intermediate track is 500, 550. And advanced track is 650. And do you think that sounds like a lot? Then uh, uh, for my late son Paul's World Challenge Mustang, uh, on Pirelli slicks, we would run between 850 and 950 on front spring rate. So you can see the more spring you put into a car, uh, the faster it goes, uh, but you, you better be able to drive it. I think anybody that, that tried to put like an 8, 850 spring package into a track day car uh, could very easily get themselves in trouble. And the other thing too is that uh, uh, those 850s and 950s were for Pirelli slicks. Anytime you're running a slick tire, you have to go way up on spring rate. Uh, I see so many people show up at, for track days and they pick up some used slicks off the off the internet, uh, and they think it's really going to make them go faster. And I mean that is that is so wrongheaded. The more the stickier the tire, the more spring you need. Plain and simple. The reason is when a car is going around the corner, it rolls. You've got what's called a slip angle on the tire. And those who've been through the Speed Therapy Academy know all about this because we went through it in great, in great depth. But you've got slip angle, and you know the, the car stops rolling because the, the tire doesn't grip anymore. You put a, a sticky tire on there like a slick, and you're going around that same corner, and there's no slip angle. I mean, the tire just sticks, which means if the tire stops, the car doesn't. The car keeps rolling, 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 and rolls way over. Well, Mustangs have a positive roll front suspension, which means the more it rolls, the more positive the camber goes. And a couple of things happen. You can, one, you can uh, chew up the outside of the tires pretty quickly because you're rolling over and you got you not ha don't have enough negative camber, and you chew up the outside edge. And the other thing is they can they can surprise you at the wrong time. Uh, I've seen a number of people that. Uh, I uh, thought they were smarter than me and went and got slicks and, and uh, on, a, on a stock suspension and, and ended up having, a, having let's see, 
issues and events, either you know, sliding off track, going off track, hitting something. I mean, it's just not even when you're doing a car, everything has to be, work together as a system. And slick tires, part of that system is high rate springs and high, highly valve shocks. So I kind of got off, got it, uh, off on, a, uh, on a tangent there, but I do that sometimes. Uh, okay, so we got back to uh, back to the last question that's going to lead into our our, our, uh, our show and tell this week. Uh, it, this is again, I don't know who this is from. So if you're out there, wave your hand or something. Uh, is the rear steer kit already set up to go, or do I have to go through the whole bump steer thing? Well, the the short answer is no. You don't have to do that. But uh, bump steer, uh, you must be looking at somebody else's uh, advertisements and want to sell you a bump steer kit. That's not what we, what we have here. What we have is something to fix the roll steer, okay? Uh, when I was doing some, some testing with Ford Racing and the Mustang magazines at Road Atlanta uh, on the, F, the original FR500, which was an SN95 car with a double wishbone front and IRS rear. Uh, at the last two turns at the end, of the, uh, at the other end of the track, the same spot on the second right hand every single time the back of the car got loose. And then coming up under the bridge, uh, the exact same thing happened. The car got loose, the exact same spot. So I'm back and I started, we'd already you know, done a lot of work on, on, uh, in, in my uh, geometry program, my computer, on trying to improve the roll, the, uh, uh, the roll center, the camber gain uh, in the back to try to see how good we'd come with, with the, uh, the OE architecture. And at that point, we really hadn't uh, focused too much on the, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the tie rods. And what I found is running through the simulation, as soon as the, the, the car got to a certain degree of roll, I can't, don't ask me what it is, it's a little too long ago, once you got to a certain degree of roll, both rear wheels turned the wrong way. So that's what I was feeling. The car would get to a certain point of roll and the back of the car would get loose because the rear wheels turned the wrong way. So what we do, this is our, this is our rear steer kit and it is designed to improve roll steer, and not bump steer. We look at bump steer on the front, the back of the car, what I'm focused on is roll steer. And it already comes, all you have to do is, is screw it on. It's already preset to get you the, uh, to take about half of the roll steer out. Now, when we do the, uh, when, we, when we do the, uh, the full uh, IRS package, our full IRS package, and we do the geometry upgrade to the carrier, then we modify the inner pickup point and we move this even, this is like moving it down, we move it even further down, which pretty much takes out all the rear roll steer. And we've had uh, just taking half of it out makes a big difference. We've had, had some of our drag race guys, and I'm not a drag racer, uh, say that on the dyno, they could see the wheels don't want to move around as much, which means if they're on the drag strip, the wheels aren't doing this as much either. So I mean, it's a big plus. But see, the, the, the rear steer kit is, is one part of our phase one for IRS Mustangs. Uh, phase one is just like we do the IRS packages in, in four stages. So phase one is the easiest. And with that, we add one of our super heavy duty uh, forward uh, torque braces. Uh, the, the factory one, if you've ever seen one, it's kind of like this curved, it's, it's hollow uh, round tube and the ends are just squished. Uh, and anything that's round is not as strong as anything that's straight. So we did, uh, we, we did this a number of years ago and this is super, super heavy duty, super strong, so it doesn't move at all. And then what we do on that is we have our uh, aluminum diff bushings. Uh, and these, these are another something that we did a long time ago and, and uh, a lot of people copy my stuff and nobody's really copied these yet. Uh, and what I've done is we make this out of aluminum instead of rubber or urethane, like a lot of them are, but I also made it so we can adjust the rear uh, pinion angle because about 2000, I think maybe was it 2000, I can't remember exactly, but there was, there was some driveline vibrations in the Cobras. 
we had one customer that had his his cobra the ford dealership like three or four times he couldn't get the vibration out they had changed everything brought to us all we did was put a set of these in of course and this uh and change the pinion angle and this is a series of this is a aluminum and it's a series of washers big little big little big little uh Part of it is it actually works a little bit like a heat sink, but they'll help pull some of the, the heat out of a differential. Now for the street, it's fine. It's not gonna be enough. Uh, it won't take enough heat out for track. For that, we need like a rear diff cooler. But the other thing, because we can stack these and there's a pin inside, uh, we originally designed it so this would sit at the bottom. Uh, the, uh, uh, the diff would sit on that and then we'd stack the, the uh, washers up on top of it. But we. Ever since we discovered that with the, the vibration, we put all the washers on the bottom, which puts the, the pinion angle up just a little bit, and we've never ever had an issue with uh, with uh, driveline vibration. So I mean that's that's kind of like phase one of our, our IRS, and it actually does a lot for traction. It does a lot for drivability, and actually helps a little bit in taking heat out because what we're doing is we're we're nailing down the front of the the front of the uh, a differential with uh, with that no rubber um, it's just solid and that helps from the getting the, uh, the differential winding up and bouncing on the rubber and that actually really helps starts to take some of the wheel hop out there's a lot more uh, a lot more things influence wheel hop but that's one of them and uh, between that and the, uh, the rear steer kit uh, we start taking a wheel hop out, which is pretty important for an IRS car. There's a lot, a lot of people like to, you know, like to hit the gas and go. And if the wheels are doing this, is is not much fun. So getting back to your question, all you have to do is just stick it in. Stick it in, adjust your toe. Uh, you want to adjust the toe at uh, 16th toe in at the back. Uh, that's about plus uh, 0.25 to plus 0.3 toe in at the back on an IRS car along with uh, maybe one to 1.2 negative camera. There's, there's a quick uh, uh, a quick alignment specs for you. Okay, I think that's got me through what, uh, what I started to talk about today. So now I think, uh, do we have any questions out there? We do have several questions that have come in. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to answer those questions um, after you went through the um, tech portion of it, save them for the end, or do you want questions now? Uh, that was the tech portion. Uh, can you put an IRS in from a 9904 Cobra into an S197 Mustang? Uh, yeah. We th that was like my second question. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, yeah, so um, if you'd like, we can get to some questions. We do have some. So the first one, and we and we do have lots of comments, and there's um, a lot of people joining us today. So thank you very much. Um, the first question we have comes from not a name, DJKR. He says, "What is the widest wheel tire combo possible on a Fox Mustang using your IRS and or your recommendation for road racing purposes? I have wheel tubs from drag racing days, so unsure what fits." Uh, uh, that's kind of like a, that's an open-ended question. It's been a long, long time since we've done Fox cars. Uh, but with the, but what we do to the rear carrier, uh, we actually take that, that big mount out, which mount out of the car, which means you can put a bigger tire in. You can go all the way to the frame rail. Uh, and I have to, I have, actually have to go back and check and see what some of our customers are running. But I would think now on, uh, now let me think out loud. Now on Roy's SN95, which isn't quite a Fox, I mean we've we ran 315s on the back of his car without flares. When we went to the 345s, we had to add flares. So I would I would guess I me mean, 305 should be should be a go, but just something you're going to have to you're going to have to work out. Uh, I mean, there's there's some uh, there's some formulas out there. Uh, there's actually some things you can buy. You can bolt it on the wheel, and it'll show you just how wide of a, a wheel you can put in there. 
And once you figure out how wide a wheel you can get, then you can figure out how wide of a tire. But it's, yeah, like it, it's been a long time since I did Fox cars. Uh, I'm sure we have some customers out there. Uh, if, if you call in, Rich might have a better idea or, or might know one of our Fox customers that, that has already gone through that exercise that can help you out more than I can. So, okay, we're going to get another question. Okay, yeah, so we do have another question from A2D Racing. Uh, Kenny, are you still interested in making an aftermarket and stronger IRS steering knuckle? Or what we call upright? Uh, sort of. I mean, we've, we've taken a look at it. Uh, from an engineering standpoint, it's a real challenge. Uh, and the challenge comes in uh, with, the, with coming up with an axle bearing that'll fit, that'll work with the uh, uh, with the stock axles and that that's the biggest challenge is that whole axle bearing thing and making the axle housing itself is not a problem but we don't want to drop the the factory uh, bearing back in because they're junk uh, i mean if, if any reason to change the, the upright is going to be to get a better like a, a, a double uh, tapered roller bearing in there that actually takes some load uh, the bearings that are used in the, in the cobras are actually uh, front wheel bearings from a, a Taurus, I think, and they're just, they're double rollers. So, I mean, they're really not, if you got roller bearings, they're really not designed to take a load. Or if you have like conical bearings, uh, like opposing conical bearings, and that'll take all the load you want to put into it. So that's where the challenge is, and we really haven't had a chance to go back. We looked at it, I think, a couple of months ago, and we kind of got stumped at that point and have not had a chance to go look uh, back and look at it again. Uh, it's, it's something that's worth thinking about. Uh, there's just some challenges we have to overcome to make it work. Okay. Um, we had a comment from Cliff Glidden about uh, his engine, which you spoke about earlier. Um, basically says, uh, Kenny's right. If you're going to spend money on a cam, then save up and do it right. My FR500S with those World Challenge mods runs great, pulls hard out of the corners where it used to lag, revs in a linear manner, and pulls all the way up to the top of the RPM curve, and it sounds terrific. So that's straight from the horse's mouth, um, the guy who drives the car on track every day. So um, those are all good um, comments and, and suggestions. So anybody who's looking at doing cams, be sure to um, Think, think about the rest of, yeah. Think about the rest of the package because that's what makes the cams work. Yeah, and so the um, next one is from Carrie, who's in the gallery, and she wants to know when does the Speed Therapy Academy start, and can I still register? Okay, well, I'll answer the second part of it first. The answer: Yes, you can still register. In fact, it starts next week, but because we've had we've had the move thing. Uh, Carrie had some surgery, so we're, we're kind of like way behind on recontacting people to sign up for the academy. We're going to hold, hold the registration open for a couple more weeks. And don't worry about missing anything because you, everything's recorded. So you can go back and you can you can watch the uh, any, anything that you missed. You can go back and watch the rerun. In fact, that's that's one of the best parts of the academy is. Uh, people love to go back and re-look at, uh, at, at the sessions I do because they, they say they always go back and look and they go, oh, man, how did I miss that the first time? Or how did I miss that? So it's uh, going back and, and reviewing it is always good. So we're going to do this up for at least the first couple of weeks. So if, if you want to sign up, I mean, it's an amazing experience. Uh, strongly recommended if you really want to learn, really want to learn about cars, performance, how to make them work, how they work. Uh, it's 16 weeks, two evenings a week. Uh, all the sessions are recorded. And then every other Thursday, we have master class. We'll bring in people I know from the industry. We'll spend 20, 25 minutes talking about their area of expertise and then open the rest of the, the, rest of the time up for questions. And uh, the academy is done in Zoom. So it's like everybody's there. Everybody can talk to everybody. Uh, it's a pretty cool format. And anybody that's ever taken the academy can tell you that it's it's well worth it. Uh, plus, you get and you can't see it. There's a banner in the way. You get a nifty speed therapy academy polo shirt. Can you take the banner out so you can see my polo shirt? Shit. Oh, yeah. Can't, 
stand on my toes. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. I tilt this down. So you get a Speed Therapy Academy polo shirt. And you get, when you sign up, you also get Speed Therapy Academy notebook uh, with a whole bunch of stuff in there. There's, uh, there's uh, dividers, so you can you can put all the different uh, sessions in. You can make copies, make notes. Uh, there's, there's really good material setup sheets, uh, tire, tire temperature sheets. And then at the end, you get a nifty Speed Therapy Academy Certificate of Accomplishment. So if, I mean, you, if you want to be the guy at the track that shows up and or uh, autocross, uh, in fact, we had, I think, two, two or three guys in the last academy that were autocross people, and uh, they came away with a lot. I mean, because everything that we talk about with the track is applicable to autocross, but in a more condensed uh, and, and slower uh, capacity. So, yeah, I mean, if you're thinking about it, uh, get in touch with us. You know, we can talk to you a little more about it. But it's, it's uh, if you really want to learn, I mean, I, I go through the car front to back 16 weeks, two evenings a week. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, in fact, every, every, and then after that, there's some perks to go with us. You, uh, any of the Speed Therapy Academy members or alumni get a 10% discount on all Kenny Brown products. And we had a number of people sign up for this academy that were going to buy suspensions and signed up for the academy so they could get 10% off their suspensions. Also, we have 10% off on their brake products. And also another perk we have is uh, if you get your, your brake pads through us, we will give them to you uh, pre-bedded for free. So, and then plus you've got like almost unlimited access to me uh, to answer your questions, help set up your car, whatever it is. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's an amazing program. Uh, if you're thinking about waiting, waiting to the next one, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, looking at, I've got a pretty aggressive development, new product development schedule for next year. And right now, it, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to have the time to put into an academy in the spring uh, because I've got, you know, I've got a huge development sheet. So if you're thinking about putting it off till the next one, uh, I suggest you do this one uh, because there might not be one next spring. Uh, like I say, I've got I've got way too many things to do. The new products up the up the wazoo are going to be coming out of here over the next two years, and uh, so I'm going to be pretty dedicated to that. So yeah, I mean it's like the, my whole purpose of the academy is is giving people the education, so they, they you don't have to rely on the internet or the guy down the street or the guy in the paddock. I tell people the two worst places to get information are the paddock and the internet, uh, because nobody really knows what they're talking about. Uh, so, but if I can help you make just not make one mistake that I made when I was starting out a long time ago, uh, then all of a sudden it's worth it for me and it's worth it for you. Because uh, mistakes, mistakes cost time and money. And uh, this, this actually would speed up your learning curve by years. Uh, you know, what you would learn in the academy over the 16 weeks would take you uh, years and years to learn if, if you ever learned all that much uh, ever. So it's uh, I strongly recommend it. It's going to be the last one for a while. So if you're just thinking about it, sign up. We we have some some payment plans. Uh, if you're thinking, well, I'd like to do it, but I don't quite have the budget. We don't worry. We got payment plans. We can we can we can hook you up. So I, I think I covered just about everything, Carrie. Yeah, so um, we have a little bit of time left. We're, we're doing pretty well. Um, we're 50 minutes in, but I, I have one question um, or topic that I'd like to, to um, talk about just briefly. There's a lot of customers um, who show interest in the various different rear suspensions that you make, whether it's an IRS rear suspension or the S197 um, rear suspension systems that you offer, but can you talk just uh, briefly about the importance of matching the really advanced rear suspension like you offer with the front suspension or not mixing and matching parts? What's the importance of using your rear suspension matched with your front suspension, assuming that the geometry changing in the rear has a dramatic impact on the geometry at the front of the car? 
Okay, well, it's, it's, let me start at the very beginning and say, it's, you know, what I talk about uh, all the time is if you're upgrading your car, uh, try to stick with one company with one philosophy. Uh, some of the worst phone calls I get are somebody, their car doesn't work, it doesn't drive right, and I start asking them what, they, what, they, what they've got you know, in the car, and they've got the springs from this guy, they've got the shocks from somebody else, they've got control lines here, bushings there. I mean, they've got just a mixed mash of parts from all the, you know, it's catalog, basically catalog parts. And the problem with that, as soon as you do that, if you're not following a proven philosophy or a proven program, then what you've just done, you've, you've initiated your own R&D program. Because uh, uh, you're going to find out how those different products from different manufacturers work or don't work together. Uh, and, you know, I would say nine times out of ten, your result is going to be marginal at best. Uh, that's why, if like you stick, I'd like you to stick with my philosophy, if not me, if you like somebody else's philosophy, you like stick with them. And that way, that you can, if you have a problem, you can call them. And depending on who it is, they may or may not be able to help you. Where if you stick with us, everything we do here is all the parts I sell are the parts I use in my cars. Okay, you don't see you know different products from a whole bunch of different people. Everything that's in our catalog, everything we sell are parts that I use in, our, in the cars I build. So we have the greatest technical support there is. If you call up, you've got a problem, and we, we deal with these, with these products every day, uh, we can get you straightened out. Uh, or if you've got like this and that from somebody else, I mean, I just can't help you because I had no idea how all that stuff would work together. So that's kind of like the first thing. But when we do, I've got a lot of people been calling lately with S197s, uh, not knowing where to start. Uh, as far as building their suspension up, if, if they've got to do it on a budget or in stages, uh, what I recommend one of the first things you consider is the uh, jacking rail and matrix brace. Uh, jacking rail are almost a, uh, you know, a, uh, a slam dunk no-brainer. Uh, that, that goes along the pinch well, which means you can jack the car up anywhere along the pinch well, and you can put jack stands under there, which opens up the underneath of the car. Uh, which makes it really easy. I mean, you don't have to get down and crawl and you know, kind of find a place for Jack and start jacking here and slip and uh, go into the, the, the floor pan. So, you know, jacking rail <clears throat> and the matrix brace ties together the jacking rail and the, the, the rail that runs down the, the center of the car with four triangulations, which really stiffens up the center. And, you know, a stiff chassis is really important for handling. And we, we spent a whole, uh, a whole uh, uh, evening on chassis in the academy. And just going through, you know, why it's important uh, and just, you know, what kind of chassis stiffening there is and how they build race cars. So that'd be the first step. But if you're doing it in stages, for 197, I recommend the rear grip kit first because the back of the car is the worst part of the car. <clears throat> Anybody that's gone around the corner with an F1, S197, and a GT500 especially, and you try to get to the gas too soon, you know, the back goes. I mean, it just, there's, there's no controlling it. And with the rear grip kit, what that does, it really it changes the entire rear suspension geometry. And it really makes the cars handle. In fact, it, it works so good, we throw the rear sway bar away. Uh, because what the rear sway bar does for on a stock Mustang, uh, we correct all that stuff with geometry, by changing the geometry. So it would be rear grip kit first, and springs and shock next, because I mean you really need some decent springs and shocks, and then the front grip kit first. And we came out with uh, a little while ago my advanced uh, rear suspension system, the AGS 4.5. It's it, it's it, it's pretty remarkable, but you can't you can't just put that on because it won't work. Uh, it's it, it's it creates so much rear grip that the the car has to be balanced for that, which means you have to have a front grip kit. My front grip kit with the improved uh, front suspension geometry, which the front grip kit is, you know, if, if you had a Mustang on track, I mean, one of the first things you do, you go into a corner, you turn the wheel, and you just kind of wait for it to catch so you can drive through, uh, drive through the understeer. Well, with the front grip kit, I mean, you, you turn the wheel, car turns. I mean, there, there's no wait, no hesitation. It just turns. So it's about quick rotation. Uh, so you have to have a front grip kit to go with the enormous amount of rear grip that we generate 
with AGS 4.5. And also because there's so much rear grip in AGS 4.5, we have to make a significant increase in rear spring rate just to get the car to balance. Otherwise, the car would have great turn in and there's so much grip in the back, it would just push the nose out. But if we go way up on rear spring rate, and we balance the car, and I mean, you, you, you get fantastic turn in, and you can just drive through the middle of the corner. You don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to wait for the axle to settle. You don't have to wait for the front to grip. You just drive through the corner, power on. So I mean, that's that's I mean, that's that's a complete system. Everything I do is a system. Okay, the you know, there's only three parts of my suspension: rear grip kit, front grip kit, and springs and shocks, because I have all the pieces, all the components. Uh, of the rear suspension are engineered to work with everything else. The uh, upper control arm is in a module is longer than factory. The pickup point's been changed. We've got the axle brackets and the the change in the axle bracket and, and the axle bracket uh, height uh, and the upper control arm that gives me the instant center that I'm looking for. Uh, something I've developed over a lot of years that I'm pretty comfortable with. It makes that best all around. And then we, we look toward the panel bar, the bottom of the differential, which brings the roll center down to the bottom of the differential. Uh, so you don't have to wait as long to get back to the gas going around the corner. Even, even lower control arms <coughs> have offset bushing. So instead of being splayed at the front, they're parallel, which means instead of your roll axis uh, point up in the air, that it's parallel to the lower control arms and goes forward. So it bring the rear roll center down, the front roll center up. I mean, you know, it's just, it just cars just work. Uh, you can break really, really late. Uh, a lot of anti dive at the front, a lot of anti squat at the back, which actually is traction off the corner, which in turn is also anti lift under braking. So the back of the car doesn't want to pop up. So, I mean, it's everything that I do is a system, you know, the rear system, the front system. Uh, and all the pieces are engineered to work collectively to get the result we're looking for. So, if, if you go looking to shop at parts, I mean, I'd like you to pick my systems, but uh, at the very least, if, if you think somebody else has a better plan, just stick with them. Because uh, then if you have an issue, you can call them and, and ask them, you know, what the problem is or how to make the car handle. So uh, I think that's the, you know, that's the whole, that my, my, my uh, stick with that, the uh, stick with one proven philosophy is the way I, I refer to it. So. And, um, okay, so we really don't have any more um, questions. We have a comment from uh, a couple of Academy alumni members. Um, if you're into cars and performance, if you're a track driver, and if you're always trying to improve, then the Academy will give you the knowledge to be better. I found it well worth the money and time. Uh, that's what Cliff Glidden had to say. Um, Brian West is in the house today. He said that he's going to see you on Wednesday, apparently. So he's looking forward to that. And that's really about it. Um, we're 59 minutes in. I'm, since you're probably ready to um, go, we had one more question, but we can hold that till next week if you'd like. That came in via email. So, uh, well, what was it? We might as well get it wrapped up today. Hey. And then, by well, the way, the, if you if, send your send your questions in or subjects. Through the, the uh, society, through the speed therapy society or Facebook, what you'd like me to talk about next week, because we're just kind of coming back off of you know the whole confusion of moving and everything, and uh, we need to start doing some planning. But I, I like to know what you want to, what you like me to talk about, because you know as I said before, uh, I'll talk about what you want to learn about, because uh, that that's you know what I'm here for. So please send in some recommendations for subjects or uh, send in questions. Uh, I can, a lot of times I'll turn questions into uh, you know, tech tips or, or other subjects. So, okay, what's the last question? Okay, the last question was, um, they mentioned that you, you preach a lot about oil coolers um, for the engine in almost every application, as well as an IRS differential cooler, particularly in the uh, SN95 or Fox body IRS cars, and then also the S550. His question is, do you recommend or do you use transmission coolers? Uh, uh, yes, but it depends where. Uh, for, track day, for, for track day cars, uh, we've never, Never really found the need to use a transmission cooler because you're only on track maybe 20 minutes uh, typically. So we never put transmission or uh, rear axle coolers uh, for track day cars. 
A race car, completely different story. No, absolutely. Like on, on World Challenge cars, we do uh, have a transmission cooler and a rear differential cooler. We absolutely positively have to have those because when you're when you're hammering on these cars, you know, flat out for an hour, you know, uh, 50 minutes or an hour, things get really hot. And you've got to keep them cool. So number one, you get peak performance, and secondly, you get longevity. So for track day cars, we really haven't looked at the transmission coolers or rear axle coolers. Uh, unless somebody's having some real overheating issues, like you're, you're puking uh, fluid all over the place. Uh, but even so, like on, on the rear axle, uh, live axle, there's a little little uh, knob on the on top of the, uh, the one of the axles. Uh, but you get a little cap on there, you take that off and, and put a, uh, like a brass barb in there and then put a tube on that, hose on that, wrap it a couple of times and go into a trunk and into a can which is your, uh, your overflow for your differential. Those, I mean, they do still do, do get hot, but typically we haven't for, for track day cars, absolutely for race cars. And for, you know, for IRS, if you're, if you're not, not taking your IRS car on track, you really, really don't need a diff cooler. Uh, if you are going on track, you absolutely need a diff cooler because that little differential, so only this much is aluminum. And for the most part, it's, you know, it's, it's encased in rubber and uh, they will get hot and they will burn up. So uh, I, a diff cooler for IRS on track, yes. Uh, street, nah, not, you know, really not needed that much. And, and then on the, and the other, car, other side, you mentioned oil coolers. When we're looking at, at building cars, most of my uh, cars, it's like street performance cars, I'll only do a radio. Uh, you know, it's like we'll, we'll address the whole uh, engine heat at, in, in stages. And the easiest thing to do is change the radiator. We've got an outstanding radiator, our, our triple pass, which the, the water goes across the, uh, the radiator three times for maximum cooling. Plus, we've got so smaller fins. We have like 18% more surface area than any other uh, three-core radiator. Uh, so first, we'll start with radiator. I mean, if that takes care of the cooling issues, great. Uh, but if it's if you're going on track and you're still seeing some elevated like oil temperatures, then we'll add an oil cooler. But any of the, any of the cars we put oil coolers on, we'll also do it with. Uh, there's a little piece we put on that mounts where the oil filter goes that we you know, we have a, that plums off to the cooler. And I always use the thermostat ones, which means that uh, the oil cooler does not get engaged. Okay until the oil temperature hits 180 degrees. Oil temperature hits 180 degrees, it opens up, the thermostat opens up and engages the oil cooler. If it gets below 180 degrees, it'll shut the oil cooler off. So, uh, you know, it, it, I, I look at, at, at cooling issues and stages because I mean, I just don't do things to do things. Anytime I make a change, I'm looking for an outcome. Uh, and, I, and typically we, we change radiators out in all our conversion cars just as, as, a, as, as, a, as a course of, you know, that's what we do, uh, because no matter what you do, increasing performance, you're going to increase BTUs, you need to pull some of that, uh, some of that temperature out. So we'll drop a, a, a triple pass radiator in. If, if there's still some heating issues beyond that, we'll look at things like vented hoods, uh, take heat out, or uh, depending on the application, you might need an oil cooler, but again, we'll do it with a the thermostat. So you're not, you're not cooling the oil before the engine's up to temperature. That's the big thing. Uh, if, if you're running an oil cooler without a thermostat, uh, you're gonna wait a really long time for the oil to get up to temperature. And a lot of times if you start driving a car without the oil up to temperature, bad things can happen. So that's why we have use a thermostat in our oil coolers. Uh, so I think, uh, did I cover that? Yep, that did a good job of answering that question. So, and those are all of the questions that we have for today. So again, thank you to everybody who um, left a question in the comment section. Um, please keep the questions coming. As Kenny said, that's um, that really helps us formulate the script for the following week. And um, also I'll subject matters. If there's a certain subject you want me to talk about, you know, send it in. I mean, I'll be happy to do, uh, to do what I can. Uh, to answer your questions or, or, or create something interesting to listen to, hopefully. So, but uh, well, with that, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up this morning. Uh, and uh, welcome to our new space. 
Um, hopefully, we're, it's kind of like a, 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 a definitely a work in progress, and we just kind of kind of pulled this together for this morning, uh, uh, so we can just kind of get back uh, back on getting cars and coffee going again. But uh, look for look for improvements to come in in the few, in, in coming weeks. Uh, we need to figure out how we're going to do this. It's uh, it's kind of like a, a, an interesting but strange space. But nevertheless, it's um, I'm calling it a studio. Uh, so if the, and like I say, if you if you've got in the future, if you're a car club or coming to town and want to uh, want to uh, watch cars and coffee, uh, let us know uh, if it's possible. Uh, we'll set you up. And Speed Therapy Academy, you know, please, if, if you're just even thinking about it casually, uh, you know, don't wait for next year because there probably isn't going to be one in the spring. Like I say, I've got a whole bunch of new products we're going to be coming up with. More on that in the future. But everything that's in the works is really, really cool. Uh, of course, you'd expect that from me anyway, I think. So, yeah, we'd like to get you signed up. And again, if, uh, if, if budget's a problem, We've got uh, uh, we've got a payment plan that gets it down. I think is uh, it's pretty low, like hundred and fifty dollars a month or something like that. So you know, don't don't waste this opportunity for an education that will be with you the rest of your life and be worth every penny. So with that, uh, I think thanks for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you all next week. And be sure to uh, share this with your friends. Uh, have them join us. I mean, we need to. Uh, we need to get need to uh, start pulling in some more people now that we've got uh, sort of a real place that we can work from. Uh, so please share and invite your friends. Uh, I think next week uh, when you come on, there's a place to click on Facebook. They can just instantly just go down and you can share it with a bunch of your friends. So you know, help us spread the word. Uh, you know, we, it's good for us and good for you. Besides, we get more questions. The more questions we get, the more answers we get. So with that, thanks for joining. Uh, and uh, uh, have a good rest of your weekend. It's going to be cool but sunny this weekend here in Indianapolis. So we will we'll be uh, we'll see you next week. Have a good weekend. Bye everybody.